good evening, good midnight, good whatever time of day or night you're listening to this. I'm your host, that lit astro chick. Still working on the slogan, but currently I have the channel where we look at the needle charts of writers, authors, artists, and anyone else that I find interesting. Today, we have entered into a new season um, because this week, the Pluto has now switched over from Capricorn to Aquarius. There have been a lot of exciting discussions in the astrology community around this. I have my own feelings about Pluto and Aquarius that I may or may not share at a later time. Um, I have plenty of time because Pluto is going to be in Aquarius for the next 20 years or so. However, we're also entering into Aquarius season and I'm going to try to keep a, a schedule with this channel to build up the profiles and the natal charts of these authors that I'm going to cover. And tomorrow is going to be Gloria Naylor's birthday. Had she still been alive, she passed away in 2016. And shortly after she passed away was when I found her work. I was in grad school and I was working with one of my TAs, the great Faraday Golden. I might do a natal chart on her if she, which she, she won't find it, but she, uh, she always had the best of reading suggestions and she had suggested that I read the Women of Brewster Place, because she said that it's a phenomenal book, and I really do love, I really do love composite novels because they're really difficult works to do, and I really do like the challenge of them. When I was in graduate school, I worked on a composite novel that I currently need to start to spruce up to get ready for applications, but that's neither here nor there. I also need to study tonight. But then, of course, I wanted to come on here and do this, um, do a little drive-by so I can get a little bit more comfortable with putting videos out on YouTube, even though it's just the um, picture of Gloria Naylor's beautiful face. So I thought that since tomorrow is going to be her birthday, and since I need to get a lot better with doing these uploads, why not just dedicate a video just to her? Because I really love The Women of Rooster Place when I... When I, I first read it in school, I thought it was really inventive. It's very imaginative. It's a um, it's a book of linked short story collections that's about the women that live in this um, housing project in D.C. and the stories of how they all got there because some were born there, some uh, came there, some had a fall from grace, and then this is where they had their um, their their resting place in their community. In. And and I, I absolutely love the book. So. Um, I'm going to read a little bit about her life, and then I'll talk about her about her, her natal chart. So Gloria Naylor's parents were sharecroppers originally from Mississippi. Um, even though her mother was lower educated, um, her mom did encourage her to read and write, and uh, Gloria kept um, journals upon journals and pages upon pages of essays, of diaries, of short story collections when she was younger. In 1963, her mother joined the Jehovah's Witnesses, and Naylor herself became a Jehovah's Witness and postponed college for a few years to do missionary work in New York, North Carolina, and in Florida. But she left after seven years because, as she said in quote, things got better, not worse. And I found this to be interesting because Naylor's uh, Chiron is in uh, Sagittarius, and this is going to represent a lack of belief. A lot of astrologers refer to Chiron as being the wounded warrior asteroid, but I find that to be kind of vague. I prefer to say that this is the asteroid that is um, that answers the question of who hurt you. It runs into orbit every seven years um, as it goes through the signs, and it displays the areas in which we have been wounded, and these will be areas that we will feel very strongly within our lives, especially if Chiron has a negative aspect to one of our personal planets or if it's conjunct to our personal planets. So an example of an author that I've covered on this channel, whose Chiron was conjoined to her, um, was conjoined to a personal planet and it resulted in a major backlash was um, Kate Corain. Based on the natal chart that I found for her, her, her moon was conjunct with her Chiron. And then of course we saw the results that that had. Gloria Naylor's uh, Chiron was in Sagittarius, so this would represent a lack of belief. Um, the people that have this type of Chiron are usually going to be exposed to a lot of extreme religious beliefs, 
and they're going to go through an ideology crisis in terms of the meaning of life. And this could be an element that would have felt expansive to Naylor because uh, Sagittarius is represented by Jupiter and it's such an expansive planet and it um, represents our, our, our belief systems, our friends, our fellowships, our faith. So it's obvious during her, um, during, during her time in the Jehovah's Witness program that she did feel very challenged by her faith, but she did move on from it. Um, this part I don't have written down, but she did later on become, um, she enrolled into a nursing program where she worked as a telephone operator in the night in order to support her children. And then um, she later on switched her major to English and she went on to earn a master's in African American studies from Yale University in 1983. And her thesis became her second published novel, Lin uh, Linden Hills. And she later on won a, I want to say she won the, um, the National Book Award for the Women of Brewster Place that was published in 1982. And that was in the category of first novel. So without further ado, Let's go ahead and let's cover Gloria, uh, Gloria Naylor's natal chart. So Gloria Naylor was born um, January 25th, 1950 in New York, New York. Um, first thing that I noticed is that she is a life path five and that's ruled by Mercury. So this is going to represent versatility, storytelling, and it's also going to be strengthened because it's in that fifth degree of Aquarius. She has an Aries North node, which means that Libra is on the south. So for this particular lifetime, Gloria was meant to be someone who was going to stand out on her own and break free from the group. And I think that her joining the Jehovah's Witness was in some ways similar to that, um, to traveling along the path of that Libra South node, uh, since the opposing side is always going to be on the south, um, on, on the opposite of the nodes. And I say it like that because her Mars and her Neptune are both conjunct in, um, in Libra. So to me, this would represent that Gloria could have been very conflict diverse and maybe would have strived more to go along with the group in order to get the group's acceptance and approval. However, that wasn't what she was supposed to do this time. She was supposed to break free. Um, so that's going to be the very first thing that I noticed about her is that her chart does carry a lot of that energy where it's going to be at the fifth degree as, um, as, as well as at the first degree. And I say that because her Uranus is in cancer at the first degree. So Uranus and cancer would refer to someone who most likely has changed their homes a lot of times and, uh, someone who could have possibly ran away from home. And at that first degree, uh, one represents the sun, and the sun is ruled by Leo, and this represents manhood, everything to do with masculinity. So I really do believe that her chart, it does express a lot in terms of, um, in terms of versatility. Venus and Mars are in nine aspects of her chart. So that means that most of her chart, it was focused on her love life, her friends, and trying to make peace with people. Um, and I have skipped around a little bit with this. Um, however, her son is at the fifth degree of Aquarius. And in fact, she has an Aquarius stellium because her son, Venus, Jupiter, Neptune, um, are all, and her midheaven are all in Aquarius. Um, Aquarius is represented by the planet Uranus. It's a planet that represents inventions, uh, freedom, rebellion, um, being a trendsetter. Um, like I said before, she had a very inventive way of telling stories that I really, really appreciated. I'm just going to go on a quick sidebar with that. Um, like one of the most impactful stories that I read in the collection was the very first one, which was Maddie Mae Michaels or Maddie Michael. It's the first one. If you open up the Women of Brewster's Place, it's the very first story in there. And I really did love that story because of the way that she's able to track time and place. It's not done in the same way as in like, um, it's been a while since I've read the story, but she doesn't tell us exactly where Maddie is um, or about Maddie's identity, but it's told through different things. So 
for example, Maddie's last name, her family chose it as a way to break away from the white slave owners that they had because the last name was under Michael's and then they chose Michael. Or when she talks about um, when Maddie loses her virginity in the fields, it like the book doesn't explicitly say, you know, she 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 was busting it open in, in, in cornfields, but you can kind of tell. Or the way that she tracks um, Maddie's son, um, his ages, we don't hear that he's five or that he's seven or that he's 10. We're able to track it more through what it is that he's able to accomplish at each age. And I just found that to be a very inventive way of, of, um, of tracking a really long period of time. And I really did enjoy just how inventive the collection was and as, as well as how grounded it was, especially because you have that Mercury in the 18th degree of Capricorn. But I do want to say that I really did love the way that she, um, the, the way that she wrote that, that particular collection. And I think that that's because she does have all of this Aquarian energy in there that there's a lot of focus around telling a story in a very different way in a very new way and um, there's also a lot of focus on that communal aspect and I think that that is something that you especially get because you have that Mercury in um, that, that Mercury in Capricorn squaring that Mars in Libra there's a tension that each of the women in the stories has in the women of Brewster's place that is around what their conscious minds are telling them about the men in their lives the people in their lives, how they feel about their families, and then of course the way that they may want to resolve that conflict. It might be in some ways a little bit too passive. So to go back to Gloria's chart, um, she is somebody who I would see as being very inventive, who would be very much about going along her path, along her own way. And she was also someone who I could see as being quite willful and very intellectual. I think that she actually would have been a lot of fun to be around. And what else was I going to say about that? Okay, so we do have a lot of this aqua energy, um, like I said before, with her Venus, uh, Jupiter, Midheaven, as well as her um, Sun in Aquarius. And this is all in direct opposition to her Pluto in Leo. Now, Pluto is exalted when it's in Leo, and Pluto and Leo, and, and Leo represented the, the boomer generation, and the way that we see the boomer generation in America is that this was the post-war generation that got essentially the, the best of what America had to offer. I don't believe that we're going to get an offer anywhere near as good as what the boomers had, unfortunately. Um, however, with her having all of this Aquarian energy in opposition to her Pluto, this would have meant that she would have had a very difficult life, um, a life where she would have been, where she would have struggled, most likely with her moves um, and her location, especially with the Uranus and Cancer, as well as with her communication of ideas. She could have been subject, she could have been subjugated in terms of being dominated, um, especially as being a a black woman, a black woman writer during this time, uh, possibly spying or surveillance, and that. As, especially I think could have happened if she had lived in a public housing complex. Um, jealousy and manipulation, all of those were going to be major themes in her relationship because, in her relationships as well as in her life, because she did have such a strong opposition in, um, in, in this Pluto. And in addition to that, her son squares her Aries moon. And typically speaking, um, Aquarius and Aries, they would sextile each other because they are so close. So a, sex, so a sextile refers to energies that work together because they're going to be compatible with each other. However, because her sun is at the fifth degree of Aquarius and her moon is most likely at either the 24th or the 29th degree of Aries, this would mean that, um, that her sun and her moon are squaring each other. And this could be a very difficult aspect in terms of our needle charts because it means that our subconscious mind is in a different place compared to our 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 conscious mind which would be our son because our son represents our fathers our children as well as our ego and our claim to fame 
this most likely would have meant that her parents were married, but it was most likely going to be a very strained marriage. She could have also had a mother that was going to be self-absorbed and she would have been placed in a lot of stressful situations because her moon is most likely at the 29th degree. If it is at the 29th degree, that's the anoretic degree. Um, that refers to a degree that points to a lot of crisis situations that the native is going to be put in a lot of third party situations in terms of how they feel about themselves, how they feel about their friends, how they might feel about, um, about their daily living and about their daily life. She also could have had a somewhat difficult relationship with her mother, especially if her Aries moon was at the 29th degree. However, I think that this is a relationship that would have mended itself, especially because her Venus is at the 14th degree of, Air of Aquarius. So those two are sextiling each other. I'd also say that because she has her moon and her, um, her moon and her Venus that are sextiling each other, she most likely has lived with a partner at some point in her life. Um, and it could have been something that could have gone on for a while. Now, this isn't an exact trine, but they are in... No, I take that back. They're not in the same sign. I was reading that wrong. Um, her So her Aries moon, it does run in opposition or it would be like a quincunx to her Mars and Libra. So I would take this to mean that she most likely did live with the partner at some point in her life, but I don't think that it actually went uh, went very well, especially because I believe that she was a single mom for a while. Now her son is conjunct to her Venus, which would make her very well loved. And because Aquarius rules the 11th house, which deals with um, networks, uh, activism, the internet, um, this most likely would have meant that her friends, they probably meant uh, everything to her. And because her son trines with her Mars, she would have been very ambitious. Um, and she also would have been someone that would have really tried to make things work with just about everybody. However, with her Mars in Libra, Mars is fallen when it's in Libra. It's either fallen or in it's in, no, I'm sorry. It's, yeah, I believe it's fallen when it's in Libra. And this could have meant that she could have met, that she could have met a lot of people who are going to be open enemies. Um, I know a lot of the times Libra is seen as being very nice and very polite, but it's also one of the signs of the military. They represent strategy. They also represent ambush. So also because this is most likely conjunct with her south node, I think that this was an energy that she could have leaned in on and relied on and then maybe eventually found out that it wasn't necessarily going to work in the way that she thought that it was. Um, now, her son does try her Mars, and I did talk about that. Okay, I need to get better with these scripts. Um, so let's move on to her Jupiter. Um, so her Jupiter and her Mars, um, those do um, those do trine as well. So I think that this would have meant that um, that she would have been someone who was going to be very well liked within her community. She also would have been very strategic in terms of controlling her public image, and this worked for her because her Jupiter is conjunct to her Sun and her Venus, uh, which are also in Aquarius, which meant that she would have had a lot of opportunities and a lot of lucky breaks that would have been brought to her throughout her life. She also would have had a lot of friends, um, and she was most likely a lot of fun in, um, in, in parties and such, because when you have Sun conjunct to Jupiter, it could either go really well or it could go uh, either completely left. So you could come up with somebody who would either be very fun to be around or someone who just might be like extra. I honestly don't know. To me, she seems like she would have been a blast, especially because she does have her Jupiter in Aquarius. Um, and, and, in, and in addition to that, um, she would have been fun. And I think that she would have been very quirky. Um, and I say it like that because she does have her Aries moon and it sextiles her Uranus and Cancer. Um, so Uranus and Cancer would refer to someone who has most likely moved around a lot, who has um, been in different homes, who maybe has experienced a domestic dispute. However, with her Uranus sextiling her moon, she also would have been somebody who most likely would not have felt very lonely because, um, because as soon as she loses one person then she's going to have a new person that's going to come in 
So in addition to that, um, I also wanted to talk a little bit more about her, uh, her Mercury and her Saturn in Virgo. Now Saturn in Virgo, um, this this ability, I think, would have made her very perfectionistic. It would have made her very hardworking. I also think this would have made her a very good editor. And one of the things that I appreciated about the Women of Brewster Place is how uh, fascinating it was in terms of the way that she edited at work, as well as her pacing and which scenes she chose and which uh, she chose to summarize. It really is a masterclass of a... Um, of, of a fiction book, especially when it comes to when it comes to the the craft of fiction, uh, she could have also been somebody who struggled with making a routine early on with her Saturn and Virgo, and I would say that because her Mercury and her Saturn these two trine, so they are of the same element. Um, this would have made her somebody who once again would have been very good at protecting her reputation. And this also would have been a very good aspect in terms of making money because it would have been something that would have been on the top of her, um, on, on the top of her conscious mind because our, because our Mercury represents what we think about in the day to day. Now, she also could have struggled with being self-indulgent because she does have so much of that energy that is in Aquarius. And also with her son conjunct or Jupiter in Aquarius, this would have made her very self-indulgent, very outgoing. Maybe she would have wanted to party or socialize a little bit too much. And in addition to that, her Saturn squares her Chiron and Sagittarius, which meant that she would have struggled in terms of how to implement her faith in her, into her routine as well as how to believe in it. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about her about her Neptune, and I swear I'm gonna get um, I'm gonna get faster at these. Um, her Neptune in Libra, this trines with her Venus Sun in Midheaven. It would have made her very inspirational, very creative, um, very very fun. It it would have given her a very ethereal quality. However, because her Mars is conjunct to her Neptune, she may have had a hard time with making decisions. She may have been someone who may have overlooked conflict until it was way too late. She also could have been somebody who would have made open enemies, but maybe would not have known about it. Um, and I believe that she maybe would have wanted to be married or had children. I believe that she was a single mother. Um, and maybe that strong desire for love as well as her conflict avoidance with Mars and Libra would have meant that she would have felt imprisoned by the love that she felt for herself or for the others around her or for the men around her. Um, as well as her, her Saturn running contra parallel to her Neptune, this would have made her impulsive at times and struggling with decisions. And it also would have meant that she would have struggled with practical matters. And I do believe that this is something that would have been very much focused on in her life because she also has her Lilith in Taurus. And Lilith and Taurus refers to someone who most likely has experienced extreme poverty in their lifetime. And um, I don't have this confirmed because I don't have the birth time, but I believe she was a later degree Aries moon and her Lilith was at the second or eighth degree of Taurus. So her moon and her Lilith would have been conjunct. This would have meant that eventually she would have had to have rejected the life that her parents had set out for her in order to gain more, especially in terms of her possessions. Um, and in addition to in, in addition to that, to going back to her, her Earth signs, uh, her Mercury in Capricorn, it does square her Neptune, and this would have represented a deception that she would have had throughout her life. Uh, sometimes this could have included deception around friends, deception around partners, responsibilities. Maybe she had a poor self-image in terms of her conscious mind. Um, and this also could have represented partners who could have lied or been disloyal to her. She was, however, very rebellious and she was a fighter and she wanted to be um, surrounded by, by better things. And I really do believe that that ambition is represented with her um, getting her getting her master's at, at Yale University. Um, she also would have been someone who would have moved closer to her public image and her life as well as to that Aries North node because her Uranus does square, sorry, um, is in opposition to her midheaven. Um, she could have been very self-righteous and very rebellious in terms of holding on to her values and her belief systems. I really am sad that she wasn't 
um, on this earth for a little bit longer. I would have loved to have met her. But when I think about did she fulfill that Aries North note, I really do believe that she did um, because she did leave a lasting impression on a lot of readers, um, a lot of writers, and um, she also had the Women of Rooster Place. I believe that it was either a movie that Oprah's um, company Harpo Productions produced or it was a miniseries. I have not seen either one. I probably should. I think it would be a really good series to watch. Uh, but she did leave a very lasting impression in terms of the way that we see Black women in, um, especially in in literature spaces, in literary spaces. And I know that Alice Walker and Zora Neale Hurston, which um, will also be some natal charts that I'll look at, that they were really really big impacts on her. And I think in turn, she paid it forward by leaving a legacy behind of her books. And that was definitely fulfilled with her Aries North node. So that's the natal chart that I have for Gloria Naylor. Um, happy birthday to her. I hope that her spirit is doing well. And I also wish to catch you in the next video.